Welcome. This is a tutorial on how to render images with Cinema 4D. In this tutorial we will um, care exclusively about, exclusively about uh, the right render settings and in order to have something to test our settings on we should first build a little sculpture so we can see what we're doing. Let's start by creating a plane which uh, lies right on, on the bottom, just like so. If you like, you can scale it up a little, so I will make it 6 by 6 meters. Let's put a cube on it, just by clicking on this blue icon again. and you can tell that this cube um, sticks in the ground halfway so let's just pull it out there by moving the green arrow upwards and holding down shift so it sits right on the bottom and then let's put uh, another object on top which will be a sphere the sphere is right in the center of our scene as well so let's just pull it up again by 300 units this time so it looks like in a museum and lastly we should put a wall in the back and maybe a fence right here so for the wall we just use another cube let's move it to the back by say 300 units and we can just use those little orange signs here to, to just scale our wall freely and if you like you can move it upwards a little I don't care about precision in at least in this um, tutorial. And lastly let's build a fence which will consist just of a polygon. So now the polygon lies on the floor as you can see. Um, there's an easy way to make it stand upwards by changing its orientation. So use Z plus if you like and move it just maybe next to the wall. I go in the view from top to position it at least a little more precisely and it may look like this but it's really not that important to rebuild it precisely. If you want to see the edges better just go to display hidden line or display grow shading lines and I personally dislike this bluish color because I think it's way too dark so let's just go to the there's project settings, it works like this, you just click up there or I think the shortcut should be command D and then you can go from default object color to 80% gray, that's the way it used to be. Okay, now in our render settings we want to try out anything that has to do with shadows, reflections, and transparency so we should give each object one of those um, yeah one of those um, how to say qualities I will just change to the standard layout you might have it should look excuse me like this that's the standard layout of Cinema 4D and now let's put some some um, textures on our object. I would like to 
put a reflecting texture or a reflecting material on the cube. Let's do that by just double clicking or just go to create new material. Call it reflect. Double click again. Call it transparent. Then we need um, a material which has an alpha applied to it. And then we can just do a solid. Maybe this will be all we need. Um, of course, we now have to set up each shader. Let's start with the solid one. I will just go to just click on it. And now you should have the material manager on the right bottom side. Let's just give it some color. I will go for a green tone and you can simply drag and drop it to the wall we have back here. Just pull it over, release the mouse button and it should turn to the color you've chosen. Now the alpha material should look like a fence so um, let's keep or how about turning it really dark I will go for black and now we should activate the alpha channel so if you don't know the alpha channel you could either watch my video tutorial on shaders or uh, just listen to that short explanation alpha is something like cut out so if I go to alpha now I click on this little arrow next to texture and choose surfaces tiles tiles is a collection of patterns and if I click on that field I do it again I just click on the name tiles that appeared right after I've chosen tiles then I have this menu so the rule for an alpha map is it's just reading black and white color and anything in between will be semi-transparent. So let's just try the following. Let's leave those uh, grouts black and turn the rest to white. I just click inside those little fields and go to white color. And now if we apply this to the fence right next to the wall, it should look like this. Of course, this is the opposite of what we want. We want a solid grid and holes in between. So let's just go back to our material, click on alpha material and remove the option soft. So now we should have a fence click on tiles again to change some more and because we want a really really fine fence to test the anti-aliasing features which we will learn to know later um, I go to grout width 2 and bevel width 2 as well so it should be a really really fine mesh and this should be okay for rendering later on if you want to go up in hierarchy you can click here in just in case you have to change something and now we let's create a transparent material which works like this you can choose a color if you like I will go for blue then let's go to basic and activate transparency now this is too much transparency of course so let's go to the field transparency reduce the brightness to maybe 90 and that makes it like almost opaque if you go down to zero so something like 90 will be okay and the refraction is kinda redirecting or 
bending the light so let's just put 1.5 in there so you have that bending effect we should as well turn on blurriness I will go for a rather low value 6 percent makes it go a little blurry and to save some rendering time use really low samples I go for 44 and 30 percent these are not specific numbers they're just um, quick to type so whatever if we're done we drag and drop the transparent material to our sphere right in the middle and now there's one material quality missing which is um, reflection so I click on my reflecting material you may want to give it a color as well and activate the transparency channel right here excuse me this time we're going for reflection so please disable transparency and turn reflection on we change over to reflection and of course we don't want a full reflection but maybe a reflection, a reflection of 50% and we don't need to turn blurriness on in this case so let's drag and drop reflection to the cube and there we could now shade the the floor somewhere um, yeah let's just do this real quick double click for a new material right in this gray field or alternatively go to create new material call this material maybe floor maybe we'll give it some more exciting qualities than just the color later on but for now I think a yellowish color might be okay let's drag and drop floor to the last object we have left okay that was it for our setup now we will use this little model to check our render settings but let's use a sky object a really simple one just click on this icon here and go over to sky let's not use physical sky in this case it's too complicated the just standard sky should be fine so our background turns to a really um, bright uh, bright gray and I think we are ready to go now so the first thing about rendering is um, that rendering means that the computer calculates our images um, the result of a rendered image is called rendering as well and a renderer is a piece of software or a program that renders out our image for us luckily in Cinema 4D there is a renderer or even two renderers installed and we uh, just try out the standard advanced renderer number three I think how to activate this there are two ways one is just for our uh, personal checking just click on that icon on the left you have three of them they all look alike but the red rectangle indicates that this image will be rendered out just in in your 3d view so the rendering when I click here will cover our viewport so this is a really nice way to to see what the image should look like uh, when it's um, finalized and how to get rid of this image by the way we cannot save this this is just for our for checking um, the simplest way is just to click somewhere you can click right here or 
if you render out again, you can even click out on an object. That's quite um, useful because if you rendered out something and then you see, oh, I don't like the wall on the back, it should be uh, different, then you can just click on that wall, even if it's in the rendering, just click it and it will be immediately selected and your rendering is gone. So in some cases you may not want to render out the image fully, so how about just clicking on the middle sign here, but do it for a while longer. Those little black arrows indicate that there are more options if you just press the left mouse button for a while longer and then you go to render region. That's the first thing here. And render region um, allows you to pull a rectangle over your 3D viewport. For example, I want just to see this part here. So I drag the mouse over until I have a rectangle that fits and when I release a rendering gets calculated right here. Why is this useful? Because you may not want to wait for this whole image to be calculated. In some cases you just want to check the reflection so all you need to do is go to a very specific corner and render those patches out. Really good. You can do several of them, but again, when you click on an object, all those small pieces of renderings will be, will be gone. So let's click on this icon again, and we have more options. There is an option called Render Active Objects. I never use that option because I don't want to see my um, geometry isolated from the rest, but it would work like this. Click on the cube, for example, and go to Render Active Objects. Then only this cube will be shown, but the problem is it doesn't show us the other objects, not even in the reflection, so it's quite useless. I think, but maybe you need it sometimes. Then there is more options here, but I mostly don't use them. Render to picture view is really important of course, but that's what you get when you just click on it like this, just a left click here, and then you get to see the picture viewer. The picture viewer is the place where you can watch your final image or maybe a preview and where you can actually save down that image. So this works like that. You could go here, file, save as, and then all you have to do is choosing a directory and then you can choose a file format and a name for your file, a bit depth. We will discuss this and just go to save. So as we are at it, let's talk about the picture viewer. The picture viewer doesn't is not named render viewer because you can actually um, load images in. You can go to file open or use copy paste commands, for example from Photoshop, and paste images. Um, but of course the standard um, purpose of the picture viewer is to show our renderings and now we'll just see what we can do with that. We can, as I, as I said, save it. You could copy this image you've, uh, you see here to your clipboard. I Let me just do this, edit copy. Okay, it's not possible in the demo, but it should work in uh, your student or in your full version and then you could just go over to uh, Photoshop and create a new file, new um, a document and go OK and then you can go to edit paste and that should be it. So copy paste works for this as well. Just go here and go 
copy. You can also remove that image you have just rendered. I will not do this now, but it's obvious what, what's going to happen. This will disappear and the image will be deleted from our list. Okay, why not? Let's do it like this. I don't want to save them. Yep, and it's gone. So I have to render it anew. And there we go. What else can we do? There's many viewing options, but I think they are most of the time self-explanatory or um, not that important for our daily work. One thing I would like to show you is a way of comparing two images. If you move around, for example, um, our camera and render new, then you will have two images in your list, one from this angle and the other one from there. And now if there would be any um, thing you want to compare, you just go to compare, A, B compare, and the just selected image gets called A. So let's go to the other image and call it set as B. So now we get a little border. We can check between differences from one image to the other. Of course, you will choose A and B differences more in case of different lighting situations or materials and not for angles. If you just want to see what angle is better, just click, uh, excuse me, um, remove, compare A and B and just change between the images by clicking on them. You can also use mouse arrow up and down on your keyboard for this. We're not going to care about animation either. Let's rather talk about the basics. There is, of course, um, the possibility to zoom in and out by using your mouse wheel or by typing in numbers or by clicking on that arrow here and go to, for example, 100 again or to say fit to screen, which might either reduce your image size or scale it up. Then next you have the render time. It's coded in hours, minutes and seconds. This is quite useful if you render something overnight then you can see in the next morning how long it took so if any corrections come up you have a feeling for how long that scene took to render. If you are into graphics, the next numbers should be obvious. 640 by 400 is the pixel size, 640 pixels wide and 400 in height. Then how the image is um, um, yeah, coded, it's in RGB, red, green and blue. That's the only thing cinema can calculate as far as I know. And in brackets you can see the the bit depth it's 8 bit by standard but you can raise it up to 16 bit or 32 and then the last entry is the image size which is 848 in my case in kilobytes and that information is quite useful um, for for later purposes we will discuss all right you have this little navigator here, but that's pretty useless because it's just the same as if you would scroll here. Maybe more interesting to you is the histogram right, right next to it. You can see how the colors are uh, distributed over your image. Like I have much reds in the middle, but in the in the rather dark parts there's no red and stuff like that you can check just like in Photoshop. Then you have the history, all your renderings will go there. You can delete them 
from the list by clicking delete. Uh, it asks me again whether I want to um, remove it and you can just do so. And what is it you can see in that list? First you have a little uh, pictogram, like a, a smaller view of your image. Then you have a name that has the same name as the file name, I think. Yep. The little star indicates that this image has not been saved. And you can re um, change the name of this image if you like. You could go left angle, sorry, and right angle to, to just have a clearer idea of what's going on. The resolution again, and that's the render status. If you just have a look, when I click on it again, for a short time, this little icon was yellowish, I think, yellow, so um, that means it's calculating, and when it turns green, it says it's done. And then again, the render time. So that would be quite good for analy analysis. You could, ch if you change render settings, you can compare here if it's uh, how much more time one technique is um, taking over the other, and um, or compare image quality, like the really fine details. Um, you can check them here or compare them. Then we have some information about the image again, when it was rendered, in what color profile it was saved, and so on. More interesting later on will be layers. Um, the great thing about Cinema 4D is that you don't only, or you're not only reduced to um, render out one single image, but you can also um, calculate at the same time alpha channels so that it should be really easy to create a mask which goes around our scene so we don't have to cut it out in Photoshop. You could create masks for any tiny object or you could even distribute um, qualities of our materials like reflections in one layer, shadows in another layer, transparency in each layer. So you will get a list later on in that's what I just talked about is multi-pass rendering and I think I will have to do as an own tutorial on that topic because it's a little complex but this would be the place to check your um, multi-pass or your your masks while rendering or afterwards but you can do this when it's rendering the filter is a way to manipulate your image while or after rendering that has some functions you may know from Photoshop shop like um, raising the gamma or changing the saturation. This is cool for testing as well and you can even save this preset down if you um, want to treat more renderings the same or you can go and create a post, off, a post effect out of this so th what you changed here will be applied automatically um, if, if you um, choose this post effect then. To be honest I never go here because I prefer to do my stuff in Photoshop, but if it's some real quick stuff, why not using it? We're not um, going to talk about stereoscopic images. And that was it for the picture viewer. Maybe one more thing. You can collapse the, um, the thing on the right and if I want to save time, I actually do this. I make sure I'm on history, clicked in here, then I can close it and just use my arrow keys up and down 
to switch between images. So you don't always need this part. If you want to, you could also integrate that picture viewer by dragging it over to some other place. This does not work in Cinema 4D13 that easy. You first have to unlock your layout, going to Window, Customization, Lock Layout, and then it should work just by dragging and dropping. And then you could put that rendering in here. And now every time I change something in my scene and render it out, my new image will appear here. Maybe you like it, maybe you don't. But the cool thing is, again, you can paste other images in here as well, maybe um, to have a look on while modeling. I will just pull it out again by right clicking and I go to undock then I have this window again or you could just close it like this. Now there's one more option you might like that's the interactive render region at first I was really excited about this, but then I found out it really slows down your computer, which is okay for scenes like that, really simple ones, but if it's getting more complex, it might be a little annoying to work with. Let's pull up that little rectangle here to get a really crisp image, which has the final quality. And now the cool thing, every time I change something, the computer gives me out a new image immediately which contains the final quality for example if I change a color it takes not even a second and you get the new image how to get oh what I want to show you you can of course change the size of this by just going to the corners and you can move the whole frame around so it'll just render there. How to get rid of this? Just by going to that icon interactive render region again and then it's gone. Now let's talk about the actual render settings but before we do this let's put up a light. I just click on this bulb icon up here just once and now just like any other object, when they are born, they stick right in the middle. So pull them out and move them somewhere so that they illuminate our scene from the side. Maybe like this. And yeah, let's check the rendering the way it is now. That's what we will get so far. So there's one thing I miss because when the light source is here, there should be a shadow. Let's close the picture viewer again. Make sure the light is still selected and go to shadow type and go to shadow maps soft. So I prefer rendering right in my viewport. I could click here each time or which is way quicker. Just go to or just use the keyboard shortcut command R which is the shortcut for re rendering in the viewport. Alternatively, you can use Shift R for rendering it out in the picture viewer. So again, Command R is for rendering here, and Shift R is for rendering with inside the picture viewer. The good thing about rendering in the picture viewer is that you can still do stuff while the computer is busy. If you're rendering out in here, any click will destroy that image you just had. So if you have a fast computer, why not rendering out an image in the background? You can collapse this window down and work further. And then 10 minutes later, you get the picture viewer up again and you can see your image. 
Now, as promised, we go to the render settings. Make sure that grid is behind that sphere. And that's the third button. Just click here and we have the render settings. The first thing you can do is you can choose a renderer. There is standard and physical installed. We will just discuss the standard renderer, but let's just show software for example. Software renders out your viewport just like you see it live. You, so I can actually see the wire and that lamp here. Um, this is a pretty useful if you have a problem going on and you want to post this online or if you have an actual video animation and you just want to check how your camera is flying around or how an object is moving then it's really quick to just do a software rendering you can go for a hardware rendering as well then your graphics card will uh, calculate an even nicer image now let's go back to standard because in this tutorial we're not talking about the physical renderer At first, I want to show you that you can save down anything you change in all those parts. From the left side, you get more options on the right side. And whatever you, you set here, you can save it down to a render setting. You can call it, for example, low quality. This would be for previews. And you can set up another render setting by clicking on render setting dot 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 and go new and you can put up a high quality setting if i click on high quality for example i can click to render setting again and here that's really useful i can copy that setting go over to a new Cinema 4D document. For example, I could load one or just create a new one. And then I have my render settings cleared, but I can paste this render setting I had. And there you go. There's the high quality setting again. Let me, let me just close this new document because I go to no because I want to see my old one again. And now one thing which is extremely important because you might do it wrong for quite a while. There is a difference, difference between clicking on the names of your render settings and clicking on that little cross here. Only the cross activates that render setting. So if I have a low quality setting which, for example, doesn't render out textures or something, and I want to change over to high quality, it's not enough to click on the name, but you have to always make sure you clicked on that cross, otherwise it won't take effect. This is a thing I do wrong quite often, just by mistake, so quickly clicking on it doesn't take effect. Of course you can delete settings, or save them down, save preset, so you can put it on your USB stick or somewhere and, and use it on another computer. But I will just delete the low quality, uh, the high quality for now, and now let's talk about the output. The output page, this one is good for um, telling Cinema 4D the measurements you want to render the image out. It's always set in pixels because that's what Cinema 4D is rendering with. And now have a look at this gray borders in my 3D viewport. If I change the size, then the borders will change and so does my aspect ratio. If I lock the ratio, then the height gets calculated as well, so the ratio always keeps the same. 
if you have problems imagining how many pixels you need for an image of a certain size, you can go to centimeters or inches and let Cinema do the calculation. For example, if my page is 30 centimeters wide and 40 high, then Cinema 4D tells me how many pixels I need. I change over to that. But you should always make sure, for printing at least, what resolution you're using. That means how dense your pixels will stand together or your printing dots, whatever. You can go to 300 dots per inches. And now let's just do this again. I go to centimeter. I go with 30 height 20, for example, at the resolution of 300 dots per inches. And now, if you're interested, you can see how many pixels it's going to calculate. And this will be quite a lot. So in case you're printing your stuff out, I would recommend you to try a little lower settings. A resolution of 200 or 250 will be just fine. If you're using really, really big images, like you want to have a size of maybe 80 centimeters wide and 40 big or even bigger, it doesn't make sense to put a resolution of 300 dots per inches in there. Because if you look at big printed adverts, they will never have a resolution of 300 dpi. But that's just my advice, because those things you're rendering out, that images, it, they will take a really, really long time if you put the the pixel size too high. That's the, This part here is the most important part for rendering speed. If you're just thinking out of fun, oh, I want maximum quality and go to, say, 5,000 pixels by 3,000, you have to be um, be clear about that doubling this number leads to four times longer render settings. So if you have maybe 2,500 pixels by 1,500 and say this image takes one hour to calculate, then doubling the render size will lead to four times longer render times. So this would be four hours compared to one. So always make sure you really need that high resolution. You could do so by going over to Photoshop and creating a document, File, New. And here you got the very same settings. You have um, the resolution and you have the width and height. And then you can just use any image to uh, try out how, it, how big you need it for printing. So using high numbers here might be a waste, be aware of that. And let me just show you how this looks in the end. I went to 400 pixels in width, so let's render this out and you see the image turned smaller. This might be okay for just checking my general mood or my, my lighting situation, so I leave it to that. The resolution, by the way, is not important as long as you um, know how many pixels you need. Cinema 4D does not care about that. It's just a matter of how um, Cinema 4D saves down that file for you, but no pixels will go lost. And you can also render out a region. Just click on that small arrow here and you'll get some more options. And you have to activate the Render Region option, and this is pretty useful. Just imagine the following situation. Let me just turn Render Region off for a second. I rendered out an image, and say this one was really big and high quality, so it took me maybe 12 hours to render. And the next morning, I see, oh my god, this shadow is way too dark. I want to change that region here. So I don't have to recalculate the whole image. It would be enough to just say, okay, from here to there should be rendered anew. So how do I do this? I go to the inter interactive render region again, which 
rectangle will be used for getting the right coordinates. So let's just pull a rectangle over that shadow area and then you go to copy from IRR that means interactive render region so when you click it render region gets activated in case it's not yet and then you see all the right coordinates which indicate this top corner and the bottom right one and when you render it out now you will get an image like this so now all you have to do is save down this image, of course you choose a new file name so you don't overwrite your original image and then you just cut it out in Photoshop and paste it over your old image. That saves a lot of time and there's another thing you should remind after using that always make sure to remove that little tick here because if you forget it then the next time you open up that document um, you you might be quite disappointed to just started a rendering out and you only had that region going on that's quite likely that you you might forget it and that's um, really really a bad thing so just take it away and close down render region we're not gonna discuss the rest that's about animation more important for us is saving images so again you could just click on that button wait until the rendering is done and go to file save picture but if you want to make sure Cinema 4D does this automatically go to save make sure this icon is activated this one as well and then you can choose a place for your file to save down click on dot 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 choose your file destination give it a name of course just type in what it should be called and go to save and then it will be automatically saved right after the rendering is done what more can you do you can choose a file format you can either use Photoshop natively that's really good so it saves down all layers into one file or you could use TIFF bitmap PNG these are all lossless formats and they support a high color depth if you just want a quick image and you don't care about its compression so its loss of quality then you could go to JPEG as well in some cases there are more options like the compression or if you go to Photoshop there won't be an option but be aware of that depth is the quality you save down your image with 8 bit per channel means that you have 265 different shades of red green and blue saved down this is okay for viewing on the screen but if you want to change your image a lot like if you use curves and different contrasts and whatever in Photoshop then you might like 16-bit because it gives you much more differentiated colors and but at the same time bigger files so if you don't have much space then you, you might want to go to 8-bit but for high quality you can use 16-bit at least on Photoshop documents and open EXR. Then one thing I want to show you first let's inter deactivate interactive render region because this should, should always be turned off um, even when you go to render region and do that trick copy from IRR you make you should make sure that after clicking on copy from IRR to deactivate the interactive region again otherwise it will just render forever and maybe slow down your rendering so let's remove that um, now let's talk about the alpha channel again on the save page when you render an image without it you won't get any mask so cinema 4d does not save down where 
to find your rendering or your, your object. But if you activate alpha channel and just hit on render again, then you can see here, clicking to layer, that you not only have a background image, but an alpha channel as well. If you want to see it, go to single pass and there you go. Now you have your actual rendering and you have the alpha channel, which is perfect for using in, for example, Photoshop to, to just cut your model out. Next thing will be will be um, or better, rather won't be multipass. We do this in another tutorial. Now for a really important thing, it's anti-aliasing. We did that um, mesh in the background. This um, this fence, those fine black lines for checking the anti-aliasing. Please just turn it out for, uh, off for now, anti-aliasing to none, and render your image again. What you will get is really jacked lines. You can see each pixel here, and it's quite ugly, and it tells you immediately that this is a computer-generated image. So there are, there is a way to get rid of this. You can go to anti-aliasing geometry and just render out for example this region again and you can see it's getting better and for most parts of that image geometry might be okay those lines are sharp you can't tell it's jacked but if you go close to really fine structures and this can be anything like a small object on like a, a dark small object on a white ground, this can be um, stuff inside reflections or on uh, just right after transparent objects. So in some cases it's, it's really hard to get rid of those like stairs. So there's the option best. Best of course takes the most rendering time and you should always go down with the max level here to 2 times 2. It, anti-aliasing works like this. It subdivides those pixels and calculates four of them if you go to one by one and two by two is doing this even more detailed. So if you are happy with one by one, two by two, it, let's have a look. And if you're still having some issues here, you can raise the max level up to 4 times 4 but I would never do this globally, but only on those very parts that are concerned. So, a good standard setting in most cases is 1x1, one 2x2, one, two two. best quality, but you don't have to keep this activated all the time, it might be enough to just go to geometry for while you're working. This gives a fairly good image and just at the very end for your perfect rendering do one by one, two by two and best. Now the threshold is something to even further improve the anti-aliasing but you should never go below 5%. Let's leave it at 10% and those settings. Now how do you do what I just told you. How do I care about that problem? All the objects look just fine apart from the one in the back. But I don't want to, to calculate the whole image with let's say really high settings because it's plainly taking far too long as you can see here. The anti-aliasing has a really really strong effect on the rendering times. Now what I can do is I lower my settings again globally and just choose a single object like this fence in the back, click with my with the right mouse button on it, go to Cinema 4D Tags, Compositing. And inside the compositing there is an entry called Force Anti-Aliasing. Clicking here 
leads me to the same settings as here, but this same time they are local. They just applied to that object I selected. Of course, I could use for this tag, I could use group of objects or several objects. So stuff like this would um, be would work for both objects or if I have put like two objects like this and I put them in a group by alt hitting alt G I can this would um, work for the whole group but for my purpose here I just use the fi fa fence I had and I can go to force anti-aliasing and now I choose something higher like 1x1, one 4x4 one, four four, and I leave this to 1x1, one 2x2 one, two two. so let's render again and see how it works this is already improved but not perfect those almost vertical lines are still not going through so I go to extremely high setting 2x2, two 4x4 two, four four, render it out again and now I should be fine alright we have the following result the overall render time is still quick but and this part here gets rendered a little slower but on really really high quality so for anything like complex areas like glass where you need perfect and crisp fine lines for fine structures or anything that, that leads to problems just give it a compositing tag and activate force anti-aliasing really useful and you should or probably in most cases never be um, forced to to change those numbers there's a way to filter your image you can use Gaussian filter which makes your image a little more blurry this is not really recommendable but you could use it for animation to have a little softer lines there's more like Mitchell and they have in, in detail they have um, different qualities if you look at the edges closely this might be um, a little softer as well and you have sync which is really crisp as far as I remember yep the best one should be just cubic and we're not going to talk about the rest now I would like to go from anti-aliasing to geometry again that was just okay note that when you have geometry turned on this trick with the render tag with the compositing tag doesn't work anymore so I if I want it to work I always have to be on best and have use object properties activated but I don't care and we go over to the options which will be the last thing we discuss about the render settings but there's a lot so let's just um, check what we can do here the first part is transparency so let's just um, render out our our sphere which is set to blurriness uh, we should turn this down to zero percent so our sphere gets rendered clear and if you render over it you can see that our transparency is working as long as we activate it if we deactivate it it doesn't matter how many materials have transparency applied you won't see a single transparent object by just if you if you just click here so now this object gets rendered like it was solid the next entry is about refraction let's activate transparency again and render it out again and you can see those lines um, get bended or bendy and this is that value here in my material manager of the transparency if you want to turn 
off this effect then click on refraction and now you see the lines won't get distorted anymore the same with reflection if you look at the cube it's reflecting its surrounding objects if you don't want that just remove reflection and it will be turned off now if you don't care about shadows for the while being or while you're working then you can turn them off as well so shadows will won't be shown either now you might have noticed that if you're using blurriness like we do on our sphere then this is taking much rendering time to calculate if you don't want this to happen so maybe once you checked if the blurriness looks good like like here and, but you don't want to, to wait for it every time, you can just turn off blurriness so that you don't even you don't even have to change it in your materials, which would be a lot of work if you have many of them. So just turn blurriness out for low quality and if you change over to high quality later on, like here, then you can activate blurriness here but deactivate it there. That would be typical for a high setting to activate blurriness. Default light is interesting if you're not having any lights, if they are all activated, cinema still spends you some light but if you don't want this effect, for example, in more complex lighting situations, you want to be you want, don't want to have that artificial light, you can just turn it off, default light, and you see what we get left is a only like reflecting or fully uh, or self-illuminating textures will be shown. This is also important for when you're using global illumination. Default light should be turned off, but as soon as you create and activate a light, then the default setting, the default light, won't be used anyway. You could turn off using textures. Um, in case we had some textures in our shaders, then we could turn them off. You can turn off that cinema um, tells you when there are missing textures. You can turn off volumetric lighting. And my general advice would be, if you know that in your scene there won't be any sub-polygon displacement post effects or volumetric lighting why not just turning it off it might save some time then another interesting thing the bucket sequence is from what direction your image will be rendered from if I have really complex settings like blurry reflections the higher the longer it takes to calculate and now I use insanely um, high values here for maximum samples and accuracy this you should never do this but I want to have long rendering times just to show you one thing when I go to command R for rendering now you can see in what direction the rendering is going to build up so it's running a, in a spiral by preset settings and this is not really useful unless the center of your image is what you want to see first. It might be cleverer to render from left to right which looks like this. You can tell it runs from here to right and this is good because imagine a situation where you have to abort your rendering and you want to render it further um, some some later time then you could just use this part already and tell Cinema 4D to start from this part here by using the option we discussed before which is render region so you could put render region on that and Cinema 4D will calculate the rest or you could use 
going from left to right for the following thing. Maybe you have two computers and you don't have much time, so you let the first computer calculate in a document from left to right and the other computer is working from right to left. So this time, oh, and yeah, with this method, you, it should be maybe twice as fast. Of course, you can go from top to bottom. That shouldn't be a surprise. Then some more options on the right hand side. The first is ray threshold. Make sure this is always on zero or close to zero. If you put wrong numbers in here, you will have a hard time because it will ignore any value below 15% which is or below the, the thing you set here. If you're using Alplan, you should really make sure that there's not the value 15 in there. It should be zero or if it's preset 0 0.1. That's the only value I think um, you can work with. Then there's ray depth, reflection depth and shadow depth. Just imagine you have a more complex situation where lights get redirected, for example, by uh, if they have to pass through glass or if you have a comp more complex situations with the shadows, you should adapt those. For example, the reflection depth means like you're looking from here it gets reflected in between there, 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 there and goes out or some, something or just imagine you have a reflective surface here and there so the bouncing between those surfaces can be limited or should be limited here if you ha choose, excuse me, here in the reflection depth so you should not put in high numbers here just to make sure because this takes a lot of render time you should always optimize this to the lowest value possible. If you go too low here, you will you will be able to tell by black spots or by, by black areas in your image. That means not enough reflection, so you can put it up. Same with shadow depth. So you can use, if you have a lot of glass, for example, in your scene, you might go for higher values. I can't tell you because any situation is different, but apart from that, my, maybe six will do. If you want to make your global scene lighter, so if anything is okay but the overall oral image is, is a little too dark, you could go up here by just going global brightness a little higher and you can tell the whole scene is getting brighter. Alright, that was it about the render settings in this uh, window here and I don't think we missed out the most important stuff if you were expecting advanced stuff like global illumination or ambient occlusion we do this in another video but if you want to you can go through all those effects here excuse me effects um, they are pretty exciting and they mostly change your image or your rendered image afterwards and it can can some effects are quite useful here now you might have noticed that that the compositing tag is useful for some more things and i would like to show you by let's say the cube we have so let's just select the cube make sure you have this item activated and that selection icon so we we can select our cube and just let's just apply it in an own render tag which is done by cinema for d tags and then we go down to compositing and let's actually start back here with the object buffer because you can create alpha channels from here. We had alpha channels already. If you remember here in the picture viewer, we could go to single pass and as long as alpha was activated in our render settings by going to save, 
and then activate alpha channel we got a general alpha channel which just shows anything you have in your scene by white color and all the background in black. If you activate another object buffer you have to tell Cinema 4D by going to multi-pass going to object buffer and then you have a group idea and those numbers should be identical so when rendering you should get another pass I'm just alright this is part of the multi-pass rendering we will discuss in the next tutorial but I think that's just too important to miss out so multi-pass should be activated here to make this effect work and under object buffer you will find that number one and one stands for the cube in our case and if I render this out again then I get an object buffer make sure it's single pass is activated and now we get the whole scene and the object buffer which is just this and what is reflected inside this or better or rather refracted in that sphere but in general if the, you have simpler situations or you, you just get this cut out and you can use this for example for color correcting your images afterwards so if you know about Photoshop then you should know this can be really handy. Let me just deactivate multipass rendering. For saving down multipass images you can mm, you you have to go elsewhere like when object buffer is activated you get a new option under save and there is a multi-pass image and that would be the place where you can save it down so you don't need to save a regular image any longer but you can activate multi-pass instead but as I said we'll do this in another tutorial that was just an information for you how to cut out single objects and that was the object buffer so what else can we do let's go to tag and now it's getting really exciting because if you want to have an unusual behavior for a single object like not dropping a shadow you can just remove it by clicking on this icon here and I, let me just put the floor to same values again or how did I just increase this material blurriness I will just turn it off so now have a look I turned down the cube cast shadows here I went to compositing tag and turn off cast shadow and this is kinda magic you can tell that my sphere is still dropping a shadow but the cube doesn't any longer or how about this item here we give the wall a compositing tag and we tell it not to receive shadows while this cube's shadow is being dropped so the result will be that the shadow of the cube reaches until the wall but as we told the wall not to receive any shadows the shadows get don't get on the surface of the wall so we can fake a lot with the compositing tag imagine a situation where you have a railway station and you have some construction uh, at the roof which looks wonderful but drops an ugly shadow then you can just use the compositing tag to tell the actual structure not to drop a shadow uh, not to cast a shadow and then you use a fake um, structure to not be seen by camera so you turn it off it will look like this the wall is gone in 
although it is there in my in my editor win window, I can I can just say um, you're not seen by camera, but you still drop shadows. Maybe that's even cooler. Um, let's just remove the um, the tag from the wall, but but care about the cube. We could say the cube should drop a shadow, but the itself the cube itself will not be seen. So let's remove the camera, and the shadow still exists. So this can be really really great for faking. Imagining for imagine for example a tree dropping a shadow, but you don't want to have the tree in the way of your camera. Then you could um, try the following. The fence back here gets, um, or it already has a compositing tag, and you don't want it to be seen by transparency. So let's have a look how this turns out. So the transparency effect should, blurriness should be turned down. So let's see how seen by transparency turned off looks you can see that it's still there so let's remove it from scene by refraction so now it doesn't turn up ag at all because we have refraction going on in the sphere so that refraction here 1.5 is ignored and because this part of the fence is behind that refracting object, it's getting ignored. With transparency, we have to see how it works. If you don't know, just like me at the moment, just do a right click and go to show help. And then if you have the language installed, um, you, you're speaking then you will find an explanation here. But that's just a quick way of doing it. I would encourage you to experiment yourself. Seen by reflection turned off will lead to the following situation. If I have, for example, my sphere compositing tag and we go to seen by reflection, we turn it off then the sphere is not shown in the reflection of the cube. If we turn the reflection back on, it appears again. So we can even make objects be seen by camera, but at the same time you won't see them in a mirror. That leads to quite uh, a lot of possibilities to, to fake situations, especially for lighting or rendering in general. Then there's ways to include and exclude stuff. And now it's getting even more detailed. For example, you might want that the cube is reflecting the wall, but not um, the sphere, then you could turn it off just the way we did. Or you can give more complex instructions like, for example, the cube here, which has an own compositing tag, should exclude, say, the sphere. Now let's see what happens. We can activate and deactivate four things you can click on them or how about including a uh, let's just see if it does anything then you can um, activate transparency that's this icon here which is going through you can activate or deactivate refraction and this stands for reflection the last icon stands for um, objects that are um, sort of uh, a child of other objects, like when they are in a hierarchy, just like this, then y they would be influenced when activated or not when deactivated. And you can put as many 
things in the list as you like and you could say like this object for example the sphere should exclude the 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 fence back here from refraction then let's see if it works that way maybe I'm wrong yeah it seems like that so we have to check this but it's a really good way of further detailing or making differences between the behavior of different objects. I just wanted to show you but um, to be honest that's really detailed and I very rarely use it. Um, if you're interested just fool around with that or read the, the help but what I use quite often is things like that, casting shadows, receiving shadows, seen by camera is really good and stuff like seen by refraction on and off too. Of course if we're using global illumination and ambient occlusion later on it might be nice in some cases to not calculate ambient occlusion on a single object or to turn on and off if it's seen by global illumination or not. That's what this is good for and I think that's it for now. That was pretty much what you should um, take care of or, or consider uh, while rendering. It's the render settings, how to to render out images or parts of them, how to save them down and what kind of special tricks you can apply. So now let's head over to Photoshop and see what we can do with our renderings. Um, we'll just open um, a Photoshop file we created in Cinema 4D. That would be my little example. And this would be quite a bad example because I forgot to uh, put in the um, multi-pass rendering settings to use the RGBA picture and the object channel number one. So I will render it out again. You should do this in your Cinema 4D version. And let's head over to Photoshop now. And I will just use the example again and this time you can see uh, this is the rendering I just did in Cinema 4D and now how can I implement this for example in a photograph and you should just go over to excuse me to Photoshop channels right here and there you go you get the alpha channel this is for the whole rendering you did and there is an object channel which means we can either just select that one building I put the object um, like the the compositing tag to with object channel 1 and we got the alpha channel so how can I make use of them it works like this this again is your um, red green and blue coded image that's the red sorry the the red the green and the blue channel and to use those masks to cut out your image you just hold down control excuse me you don't just hold down command and click on the alpha channel so you get a nice selection around your um, around my houses here and you have to take care in this case I have the selection, I only selected the background, so what I need to do is go to select or selection and invert the selection. That's command shift I if you use shortcuts and now I have a nice cutout of a nice selection around my picture and now I could either, yeah maybe that's the easiest, I just create a duplicate or a alt duplicate 
So I hit Alt and click on this white sheet here. No, it doesn't work either. So how do I do it? Uh, just duplicate the layer and now you can click on the mask icon to have a um, cut out rendering. So again, because I almost messed it up, if you have the original rendering, you can do a duplicate by right clicking and say duplicate layer or by hitting Control J. Then you get a new layer right on top. You go over and choose one of your um, um, of your channels. You can by the name double click on them and change their names like whole I don't know um, whole thing and maybe a single house. So later on, if you have ten or twelve of those guys, you, you will uh, it will be easier for you to know what is what and. Now it works like this, you hold down control, uh, excuse me, command, click into this um, selection and you go over to layers again and now you can see by those two dashed lines that this is the area which is selected, so that's wrong, so you go to selection, invert selection or just command shift I and all you need to do now is click on that icon with that little circle inside so your rendering gets cut out. Now let's hide the background rendering which shows the background. Uh, so we just have now that cut out and all we need to do now or what we could do is just opening um, another like something with grass and you could copy that image and paste it just using um, command A for selecting anything go over to your rendering hit control V for pasting and just change the the layers and now you have your rendering clearly cut out in front of a photo. So this would be like the very basics not on compositing but on how to use um, the alpha channel to cut out your rendering and now something special if you would like to just click back on RGB if you're having problems seeing your stuff if you would like to just use a selection on a single building like in a part of your rendering hold down command click on single house and switch over to layers again and what you got now is a selection which is extremely precise just around of a part of your object this is object one in my compositing tag so I could now use for for example some curves and I could just change stuff here which is supposed to only apply on my image uh, we have the same problem again it's just doing the opposite it's just changing anything apart from the part I selected this is because I should invert my selection first so I go to selection invert and now I just have this part in the middle and I can go to my curves again and now it should be easy to just change for example the overall brightness or a few colors so that way I can change the color after I rendered out so if I find out I need a different color for some elements on my facade or my windows should be tinted darker I can use those channels here just the, select the right one 
use command, click in there, and in some cases you have to invert the selection, but apart from that, it should be a really quick way um, to, to work with between Cinema 4D and Adobe Photoshop.